Down on the coast of Georgia is a town called Statesboro. Now, it's not far from Savannah. And from Statesboro to Savannah to Atlanta to Little Rock to Fayetteville came our speaker tonight and his good wife for tomorrow. Feedy. Thank you, Richard. Let me get through the amenities of what I'm supposed to do. And I, every time I get up here, my brain sets down back here, and I never know how this thing's going to come out. But I want to certainly thank the committee for asking out of myself out here. Uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege for us to be here. And, and it still amazes me why anybody wants to listen to this. You know, I, I never have understood it. I still don't understand it today. Richard and his lovely wife took us over this city and up in the hills and the mountains today. We live in flat country down there, and, and hell, you wouldn't think of building a house on a 10-foot hill. You get a bulldozer and you level it out. We don't have anything like this at all. We, we don't do this down there in our neck of the woods. Now, I don't know how this thing's going to come out, and Max is over. He's heard me before, and it never comes out the same way twice, and it's according to how y'all react to it, really, what happens up here on this thing from here on out. Cause I can tell it in such a way that, that we will all be crying, and we'll all leave you toward all the hell and back. Or I, I can get in the funny part, and we, we can go to funny right, we'll all be laughing. Then I can tell it as it really happened, it won't be anybody here but me. You know? <laughs> and the big book says we tell in a general way. And, and a guy told me in Longview last week, said, CD said, you know, and, and if you get one or two that says they like what you said, it impresses me. And this one guy comes and says, I like what you said. So that impressed me. He said, because you tell your story, and that's what it's all about, and that's what I'm, I'm going to tell my story. That's all there is for me. I'm not going to quote the big book because you have a big book and you've read it or you wouldn't be here. You know about the 12 steps and 12 traditions, and you know about chapter 5, which I think is the greatest piece of information that's ever been put on a piece of paper in my life, chapter 5 of Alcoholics Anonymous. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. To me, that's the most impressive thing. I've heard it 10,000 times, and it never ceases to amaze me what it said. So tonight, if you'll bear with me, I don't know how it's going to come out, but I'll try to get started in the thing. I'm C.D. Collins, an alcoholic from Statesboro, Georgia, the A.A. capital of the world, we think. <laughs> By the grace of God, as I understand him, and this program, and you people, I've been sober 22 years, five months, and some few days now. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a miracle, if you had known me. It never ceases to amaze me that I'm sober. I don't know how y'all feel about your own sobriety, but it never ceases to amaze me that I can function on a daily basis without drinking. I can tell this thing in a, as I said, in a funny way or a sad way, and to tell your story is a very traumatic thing, you know, to tell it as it was. It, it's trauma, really. So the lovely lady I have on my left here that's now graded, that I love very much and always have loved her, and yet through my alcoholism I destroyed her love, and everything in the world that meant anything it, to me as a result. You know, I, I destroyed it all because of what liquor did to me. I didn't start out in life to become an alcoholic. I bet they're the one here to start out in life to be a drunk, you know. My mother didn't raise no youngins to be drunks. So that wasn't her deal no way, you know. We, I was raised on a farm and, and raised up to go to Baptist church and, and Sunday school and had to go. And, and I don't know why I was overly mothered or underly fathered or what happened to me as to why I turned out to be a drunk. I don't know. And, and I don't go back and look into it. Now, I don't check on why I'm a drunk. You know, I accept it. That's all. Early in my life, had I had any sense, and I have to be real careful about people who come in the air, and I say, well, looks like he had sober up. I didn't sober up. I went straight in the gutter with it. Had I had any sense, had I known anything, I would have sobered up years before I did, yet I did not. I went straight on until it was necessary. There was nowhere else to turn for me to sober up. Had I had any sense down in the little town of Leesville, Louisiana, I'd have sobered up years ago but because of an incident that occurred down there. I came in one afternoon from work when we were building Camp Pope. I walked into the bedroom, was getting undressed. I was in the bedroom, and my father had given me a nickel-plated Colt 45 revolver, and it laid in the top dresser drawer with six bullets in it. I came in there, was pulling off my clothes to take a shower to get undressed. And I was sitting on the side of the bed, and I had reached up and opened that top drawer and reached and grabbed that nickel-plated Colt 45, cocked it, and pointed it at me. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed, and she said, Tell me all about it. The damn computer went crazy in my brain, you know. <laughs> What was it? I didn't know what it was, you know, it, 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 you know. And I hear a lot of people, I was facing eternity. I could see the, the, the ambulance and the hearse and everybody. They could see the funeral and the whole deal. I knew I was fixing to die right then. And I started something and I became very good at. 
later on. I began to cry and to beg and to pray. And I got all down in the floor and I began to walk. My first indication was to run. I'm a runner. I wanted to run, but I was an outstanding shot with a pistol. <laughs> and I thought about jumping out the window. And I thought, well, if I go through the window, she's going to shoot me in the back. And I thought about coming out around and going down the hall. But I said, she'll kill me before I can get to the front door to save my life. So I, so I fell in the floor and started hollering and carried on like a nut. And I put some doubt in the mind. I finally figured out what it was, you know, and I began to put some doubt in the mind of what it was. But I tell you one thing, that cut out it then. That, that, that eliminated it from then on. I never had no problem with it for more. <laughs> Somebody over knows what I'm talking about. I met this beautiful lady as a senior in high school, and I went off to my mother and father, sacrificed a lot to send me to school. I went to a lot of school, didn't learn anything, but I went to a lot of it. I married out of my senior year in law school and wound up in the military service, old Army Air Corps, flying P-40s, P-47s, and this type of thing, and drinking liquor. I don't know about y'all. When I started drinking liquor, it just seemed to be the thing to do. I never, I didn't like the first drink I took. I didn't like the last drink. It was always, it never did taste good to me, and yet I always had to have a chase to try to get it down, and, and I threw up a lot in the beginning, but yet, if I worked at it real hard, I learned to become a good drinker, and I used to compliment them on my ability to drink liquor. I said, you can drink liquor like a gentleman. I'd stick my chest way out, you know. Because this made me feel good. You know, I'd hold a chair out for her to sit down, open the door for her to get in the car and this type of things. And I said, if I act like old John and, and get drunk or talk ugly, I'll quit right then and there, you know. I'll quit. I'll lay it down right then, so don't worry about it. I went through World War II without a lot of difficulties other other drinking liquor. And I was stationed out in Kansas, went to RTU out there. So I've flown over a lot of this. I, I hope I don't forget an instance of coming into Memphis one time and come back across these old dark mountains and getting lost. And tell you about that. But anyway, I, I finished my World War II service and came out and went to work for the governor as an attorney in Atlanta, Georgia, and drank liquor on occasion. So there was no pattern to my drinking. And we drank when we had an office party. And if we didn't have an office party, we didn't drink. And I continued to fly for the National Guard in Georgia there. I flew, still continued flying P-47s at this time, the old jug, and had these weekend deals, you know, what we call a weekend warrior. And we were protecting you people. We'd fly all over the countryside, you know, getting our drills in and and I'd fly to Dallas and the Miami and the Washington, wherever it was a good town, and be eight or ten of us, and we'd go there and get drunk and raise sand, stay there three or four days and come back. And I was always getting weathered in and weathered in. I'd call out, I was weathered in all the time. Weathered in here and weathered in there. And uh, she would say, well, honey, don't take off at the weather's bed. Stay right where you are. <laughs> Sometimes the sun would be shining brighter than it was today, you know, and I'd be weathered in. I went up to Washington one time and got weathered in up there, and somebody came over to the house. A friend of mine, who was, his wife, came over to the house while we were in Washington, D.C. And I called back and told her I was weathered in, and of course, the mayor was over there, and the mayor said, and Dick was up there with me, so the mayor said, well, let's check on the weather. So they the mayor got on the phone, called Dobbins Air Force Base there in Atlanta, and got the weather officer on the phone and asked him what the weather was in Washington, D.C. He said, the weather's clear and the visibility's unlimited up today. It's beautiful. I come dragging in about Tuesday. You know, all beat up, messed up, and I don't know what's wrong. I said, been sitting out of bed days trying to get off the ground. <laughs> she said, well, Mary called over the weather officer, and he told the weather was clear. I said, Ida, remember what I said in the beginning? I said, Ida, you can't, you can't find out what the weather is in Washington, D.C. It's top secret. <laughs> <laughs> if you call over any more checking on me, you're going to get me in trouble. I'm flying these highly classified missions, you know. <laughs> She's going to kill me, I know that, by telling some of this stuff. I, <laughs> I continued to fly there for the guard, and I checked out in jets in 1949. I, I hope we got some pilots here, because they will understand, and maybe you will too, a little bit what I'm fixing to tell you. I think some of us had a reason to drink liquor, if you think about it. I look back some time, and I had a reason to drink liquor. I learned to fly a jet aircraft when there, there were no two-seaters. I come out of a P-47 into an F-84 Thunder jet, having never been in a jet in my life knowing nothing about it except what I read out of a book. I shall never forget the checkout day because they put a guy behind you in a chase plane to follow you, you know, when you check out, and, and I'd read everything I could, and, and a jet's a simple aircraft to fly, but it, I was literally petrified because of the speed involved in it. They said that's one thing I'd have trouble with. Well, I'd been used to sitting in a cockpit with a great big old radial engine sitting out there with a full-bladed plop. I now got in an, an airplane that just had a little plexiglass out and it's like being shot out of a cannon you know and I got in that thing and if you can get the fire started in the tail and thing it'll go <laughs> so we got the fire started in taxi out in the runway and got right on in this guy got right behind me a guy by the name of Patillo and I pulled the coal of this jet we had 7,500 feet of concrete and a 500 foot dirt overriding this was in July 
had a full tip tank. And about 5,000 feet down the runway, this blue smoke began to come up between my legs, and I thought, God, it's on fire. And I, run my, I pulled my glove off, run my hand out. It was cold. It was air-conditioned. They forgot to tell me about it being air-conditioned. I pulled that thing in the air, and literally was so scared, I just opened my said, Ooh! And away we went. And the guy following me, I never did make a move or nothing. It just scared the living tar out of me. I just said, like, Ooh! And old, old Patillo called me in a minute or two. He said, you better make a turn. You're already in Alabama. You know? <laughs> I've been flying an airplane that cruised at 250 miles an hour. Now I wanted to cruise 500 miles an hour. You know, and this is one hell of a jump in speed, you know. I come back and landed that thing and got drunk as a cooter as a result of that. I was called back on active duty in 1950 during the Korean conflict and put the uniform back on out of myself. Went back into the military, sold our home, and left the government. And wound up at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, in TAC Air Force headquarters. And I wound up going around the countryside, putting on firepower demonstrations for the Army, showing them what the jet aircraft could do. And we'd drop napalm and shoot in front of all these big wheels and show them what all we could do. And we'd run all the countryside doing this and drinking a lot of liquor, and we lived there on the base in a nice home at Fort Bragg. And I met a man there from Arkansas, and I'm a, he's not an alcoholic, so I can break his anonymity. His name was Paul Douglas. He now lives in Conway, Arkansas. Somebody you may know it. He was my commanding officer, and we became very good friends. And we drank a lot of liquor together. And we'd leave out and his wife together, and we'd tour all over the countryside putting on these demonstrations. And I got orders to go overseas as a jet fighter pilot, and Colonel Douglas didn't want me to go. He said, you're a good officer, and I was not a good officer. The only thing I could do was fly an airplane and drink liquor. That's the only qualification I had. But anyway, he tried to change orders when I was unable to do it. So they gave us a farewell party at his home before we went to Langley Field for staging for me to go overseas. And if any of y'all ever know anything about these Air Force parties, this is quite a brawl. Everybody gathered around, and we all drank liquor and hugged and kissed and took pictures and made tapes. All this kind of crap that you do at a drunken brawl and about four or five o'clock in the morning Colonel Douglas came over me and said CD can you fly a B-25 I said I'm the best B-25 pilot you've ever seen he said would you take me down to Columbus Georgia in the morning I said I'll be glad to I'd overheard part of the conversation she came over and said well you can't fly no B-25 you're a fighter pilot you're single engine that's all you can do I said I, he's drunk and I'm drunk and nobody's going anywhere forget it the party broke up by daylight and we go home and I'm in the house again getting undressed, and this colonel drives up right across the lawn, right up next to my one, and blow the horn hollers. Let's go. <laughs> I put the uniform on, stagger back out the door, get in the car with him. We drive down to the flight line at Pope Air Force Base at Fort Bragg, pull up in front of operations. I look out right in front of operations, and there's that a B-25. I knew what one looked like. I'd taxied by him a lot going in and out bases, and one was sitting out there. <laughs> We went in to fill out a clearance to go to Lawson Field and came out, and the sergeant came up and saluted. He said, Colonel, your aircraft's ready. He said, okay. So we staggered out to the aircraft and got out there, and there's never been in one of my life, as I said. There's a ladder come down between the main gear and a B-25, and you crawl up right through the belly of it. So I got out. I said, you go first, Colonel. He said, no, you go first. So I climbed up through it and sat down on the back seat. It had been plushed up for VIP. And I sat down, and he come up through the belly, and he said, get up front, Collins, and let's go. And I thought, well, you know, the party's over. We go back and drink some liquor. I just will stop it right now. I said, listen. Douglas, I can't fly no B-25. He said, hell, you said you could. Let's go. <laughs> this sergeant turned as white as a sheet. I thought he was going to faint. And if I'd have been him, I'd have left right now. I just walked off in the Air Force and left the whole deal. I said, I said, sergeant, can you start the engine? He said, yes, sir. I said, I said, you get... <laughs> You get in the right seat, and I'll get in the left seat and crank it up. And so he got in the right seat, and he got it all, the both fans turned in. I looked around in the cockpit, and a lot of things I recognized that were similar, you know, another aircraft I flew. A lot of it I did. I said, where does the fuel go? He says, it all feeds into one main tank. You don't have to worry about that. I said, okay. I called a tire for taxi instruction, and they cleared me out to the end of the active runway in that B-25. I got out there, and I didn't know anything to check, so I just caught the brakes with my toes, and I grabbed those throttles and pushed them all the way forward. And everything went up into the green, as we say in the Air Force. And if everything goes up into the green, that means it ought to go. <laughs> so I called the tower for takeoff instructions, and they cleared me off that active runway at Pope Air Force Base. And that B-25, me, a lieutenant colonel, and a sergeant, three people on board, and there wasn't a damn soul on board could fly it. Now, y'all think about that, will you? <laughs> about halfway down the runway, it occurred to me, this is a hell of a way to die. I just thought about it. <laughs> We got in there and headed on down for Columbus, Georgia, and about an hour out of Fort Bragg, liquor died out. 
liquor died out, panic set in, just in that order. When it dawned on me that I was flying the airplane, it, you know, then it dawned on me that you are the pilot, you know, and I got terribly disturbed about the whole thing. I got so excited I couldn't hardly sit up there. I said, go back and wake up that colonel and tell him to come and help me land this damn thing. So the sergeant went back in and woke the colonel up. He come back and pulled up my headset. And he said, the colonel said, bring it in over the end of the runway at about 125 miles an hour, chop the power, and it should land, you know. <laughs> I made a beautiful landing at Lawson Field. Went out, went into the officer's club. I had three double martinis and flew the damn thing back. Now, that's insane. <laughs> that's what liquor does for me. I went on overseas as a jet fighter pilot. Left out in the state, two small children, pregnant with the third, and I got in the southern part of Japan, flying F-84s, because we didn't have a place in Korea at that time to take the F-84, and I flew out of Izuki Air Force Base, southern part of Japan. And when I got over there, I realized I didn't want to fight, I didn't want to die, I didn't want to be there, and, and I was scared. I wanted to be back home drinking liquor when having a big time, and I was over there, and they, they wanted me to fly combat, and there wasn't any way out of it. And I began to drink liquor now for a different reason. And most of us in our alcoholic life can pinpoint when you begin to drink liquor for a different reason. I no longer drank liquor to party and to have a big time. I drank liquor because I needed it to give me guts, intestinal fortitude to do what I had to do. Every morning we'd go down for briefing, we'd come in a huge room and they'd pull down those maps and take those pointers and tell you where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And I shall never forget this. In the back of the room they had a big coffee urn that held a couple hundred cups of coffee and had combat liquor that was issued. Most of you people who've been in the military know that the Air Force and the old Army Air Corps, we were issued two ounces permission flown. The government paid for the liquor. We were supposed to drink it when we got back for debriefing purposes. I drank mine for going, not coming back. <laughs> that guy would get up and pull that map down, take that point and tell us where we were going to go and what we were going to do. And he said, now if you get shot down, and that would upset me so bad I couldn't hardly listen to him anymore. And I'd come out there and take that double shot of bourbon and I'd pop in that F-84 and go north into Korea and drop those two 1,000-pound bombs and get rid of those 36 rockets and 1,800 rounds of ammunition and come back. I found that I could fly a jet with anywhere from five to seven drinks under my belt and I've heard a lot of people say, well, it looks like, don't look like you could do that. Yes, a jet aircraft's the easiest aircraft in the world to fly. And it, as I said, you get the fire burning in the tail of it's air conditioned, pressure rise, and once you get going, you even leave the noise behind you. So, so you can fly one. I'd turn on 100% oxygen and I've asked the doctors, but turn on 100% oxygen, to clear your vision where you can see, you know. Just flip on 100% oxygen, it kind of clears everything up for you. And I'd go north into Korea like this, and i tell you one thing, I'd go up there, even with that amount of alcohol in my system, I'd still be very fearful. And when the MiGs would bounce us up there, I'd get scared to death. And I didn't shoot at anybody unless he got in my way of me coming home. Now, I lied a lot of <laughs> I lied a lot about what I did when I came back, but when I got in AE, I tried to get it truthfully. I knew I crossed the point of no return while I was over there. We finally went up into Korea, and I flew out of Tegu, Korea. And while I was up there, do we have any Catholics in the audience? <laughs> while I was in Tegu, Korea, I ran into a Catholic priest by the name of Father Ford up there. He, he didn't like airplanes. He came over by boat. He wouldn't fly in an airplane, but he was over there looking after the pilots. And every time a pilot would get killed, he didn't care what faith he had, he'd have mass for him, you know He's a great big red-faced Irish, about six foot two, and loved liquor. And me and Father Ford became very good friends and did a lot of talking. I wrote my mother about Father Ford, and she wrote back, Don't you want the Catholic Church? She got all excited about it, you know. <laughs> but I like Father Ford, and, and uh, while I was in Korea, I started hemorrhaging from the nose, and they need to operate on me, so they sent me back to Japan to be operated on. And I asked Father Ford, I said, I've been on this liquor for almost a year now, and, it, and if I go back over and they put me in this general hospital in Nagoya and take this liquor away from me, what's going to happen to me? You know, I, I, I don't want to happen to me. Do you have any connections back in Japan? He said, well, I don't, I don't have any connections, Colin, but I'll call over and see what I can do. So he called from Korea back to Japan and finally got the Catholic priest in this general hospital on the phone and told him, said, I'm sending a Lieutenant Collins back over to be operated on from there. I said, He's a Baptist in a hopeless case. Don't try to convert him, but bring him some liquor while he's in the hospital. <laughs> so the day I checked in the hospital, this major came in with a little cross on. He brought me a fifth of liquor. Every day I was in the hospital, so I stayed drunk even in the hospital. And I will be eternally grateful to the Catholic faith for this. Now, you think about it. <laughs> Had you waited on the Baptist to bring you a fifth of liquor, you'd have died and went to hell, too. If 
If I ever change religions, I'm going Catholic, because they look at <laughs> They really look after one another. I know if there's any place, as I said, I could pinpoint it. It happened to me while I was o over there. And, and uh, evidently, subconsciously, I think every now and then we get a little clarity of mind or something, because when time comes for me to come back from over there, I requested transportation back by boat rather than plane, because I wanted to get off the liquor. I've been on it day in and day out. Day in and day out. Never missed a day without drinking liquor. Woke up in the morning, took a drink of liquor the first thing when I woke up. Did some of the craziest things you've ever seen. I don't know how in the world we won a war because if everybody was like us, and, that, I'm, and including everybody, my fighter group over there, we all drank liquor and drank it excessively. You know, every day we drank liquor. That's all we had to do. I shall never forget an incident that occurred while I was there. Two majors came in. We had lost five boys out of the barracks I was in. Five of our pilots had been lost, and, and we two majors came in. One of them was from... Hawaii and other ones from way across Georgia. And about 10 o'clock in the morning, they came in with the B4 bags and they picked out little cots and, and found a place they could put down the bag and pick them out of bed. And they, right in the corner of the barracks, we had a bar we'd built up out of ammunition cases. And they came up there, and we at 10 o'clock, we had been drinking liquor, you know. And they came up to the bar and introduced themselves. And we said, you want to drink a liquor? And they said, why, no, we, we don't drink liquor at 10 o'clock in the morning. Y'all do this? They said, we do this every day, you know, ain't nothing wrong with it. So they went back and started unpacking their clothes, and this is a little Korean barracks with a little concrete strip, about as wide as this aisle down there, and a door right there, and they back taking the stuff out of the B-4 bag and putting it in the ammunition cases, because that's the only place we had to store our stuff. This boy from Greenville, Alabama, I'll never forget him as long as I live, he said, you want to see me ricochet a bullet down through that? I said, yeah. <laughs> so he pulls out a forty-five, and just shoots down at the floor, and bullet his floor and goes right through the door. Well, these two majors, when he shoots, they, they make a lunge for the window. They tried to jump through the window, and they got terribly disturbed about this thing. They came back up there and cussing and all upset. Said, what do you all mean shooting down there between us? Said, hell, if you don't like it, move out. We didn't ask you to come in this bar. But a week later, these majors are ricocheting them through the door, you know that? <laughs> so you wonder about all this. I came back on board a boat, but I didn't know what would happen to me, so I threw away half my clothes, and I packed 12 40-ounce jugs of Seagram's V.O., in my B-4 bag and got on board that ship with it at Yokohama. And I was drunk all the way back to the States on board that ship. I got back to the States and called out. I had a son born while I was in Korea, D.D. the third. I hope I don't forget to tell you something about him. He was born while I was over there. And the day he was born, I guess it cost the government $10,000. We shot every gun on the base, and I bought all the liquor, and we shot guns all the shot any aircraft guns and everything else, raised and sand because I had a son. When I got home and I and the two girls met me down at Savannah, Georgia, I had left the States weighing about 137 pounds, and I drank so much liquor I had bloated. I don't even have seen anybody bloat. I, I'd been eating sardines and soda crackers, and I'd swell up like a frog. A great big handlebar mustache, cheeks puff way out, and I could, I could see my cheeks would look straight out. And, <laughs> and when I got off the plane in Savannah, I and the girls just didn't recognize me, you know, and I told them who I was, and they wasn't too eager then even to kiss me. <laughs> And this hurt my feelings very much. And uh, on the way home, I stopped and got a fifth of liquor, and I was drunk the first time I laid eyes on my son, C.D. the third. Went back to Atlanta, Georgia. We moved back up there and took the job back with the government. And I hope none of y'all work with the government. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings about the federal government. But if you work with the government as a lawyer, the one requirement they had that, that you don't fall out of your chair. You know, if you fell out of your chair, they fired you. <laughs> we had a lawyer that fell out of his chair one day, just boop, you know, and they fired him. But, so I spent a lot of time locked in, you know. I <laughs> I'd sit down in that chair and hold on. I was scared to go to the bathroom sometimes. I was scared I'd fall. <laughs> I'd leave the house every morning with a drink of liquor in my hand going to work. And working as an attorney, you, there's no way they can check on you. You know, I like this because you get a big case on your desk and you just flip a few pages. So I said, what you doing? I'm thinking, you know, thinking. And this is the way I got through the days. Now, this period of time, things went from bad to worse real fast on us. And I was drinking, looking, staying gone a lot. And I was raising holy hell. And you'll have to read your own story into this. And I was riding up down the road crazy as a bed bug. And I finally could no longer tolerate this situation at all. So she left me and moved back to Statesboro, Georgia. Left me in Atlanta, Georgia, and moved back to Statesboro and divorced me. And divorced me for habitual drunkenness. And it's a matter of public record in my courthouse today. And if you're ever in the clerk's office in Statesboro, Georgia, you can read about me. I'm a certified drunk in Bullock County. This tells you. It tells you right in the divorce decree that I am a drunkard right there, and that's what it says about me. So I, I'm not anonymous there at all. A lot of people ask, how did I find you in Statesboro, CD? I say, ask the police. They'll tell you where I am. But I had to divorce me, and uh, 
I found out immediately this wasn't my thing, you know, without her. I don't, you don't get along too well without a wife. At least I didn't. Who washes your clothes? And who sends them to the cleaner? Who tells you to bathe and all that? I mean, it, it's all got all messed up. And I wound up over in Birmingham, Alabama, working over there for Social Security, and that's a drunkard's paradise. And I got over there, and in Alabama, not in Georgia, they sell miniatures in little restaurants and drugstores. You can whip right in and get two ounces of fam and take it and be gone. And I got into in the Birmingham, and, and I established credit over there with Louis the Greek, who ran the social grill right across from where I worked now. And I established credit with Louis. And I got over there, I said, Louis, my wife sued me for divorce, and all of my funds are tied up. Hell, there wasn't any funds, but I told Louis. And I said, I'm going to need a little credit while I'm here. He said, Mr. Collins, anything you want. Anybody got the job you got? And so I tipped all the waitresses a dollar. And the first few times they waited on me so they would know who I was. This impressed them at that stage of the game. So I had a deal worked out with the waitress. You know, you get this 10 o'clock coffee break every morning. We go in and sit around this huge gray oak table. And the waitress would put me a double shot in a coffee cup and set the cream on the side, put a spoon and slide it to you. You know, and, I, and the only thing you've got to do about that, you've got to remember to blow it like it's hot to, and sip. <laughs> And I'd get a double shot every day like this, you know, I'd get a double shot at 10 o'clock, a double shot at noon, a double shot at 3 o'clock. I'd get through the day like this every day. It's the way my day went, every day. Thank God I had joined the church as a young man and had believed in God and had long since lost uh, my connection. In my own life, I believed in the good Lord gets your attention. And he began to try to get my attention. I'm over there working for the government. I was in Statesboro, Georgia, trying to look after three small children. I'm in Alabama trying to stay drunk. And the good Lord intervened in my life, I believe, because one day they came in there and asked my secretary, we'd like to see Mr. Collins, two men. And uh, she said, why, certainly. And they came back and she did, brought them in the office. They introduced themselves, and I assumed, I don't know where, most alcoholics assume a lot, and I assumed that they were with Social Security, the local downtown office. They said, would you mind riding downtown with us? I said, not at all. I'd be glad to. I told my secretary, I said, they got some kind of case they want to discuss with me, and I'll ride down and talk to them about it. So we went out and got in a plain black Ford and drove downtown Birmingham and pulled up in front of this huge gray building, got out of the car and started in the building. When did one of them drop behind me? When he dropped behind me, it dawned on me what was happening to me, and I screamed like a stuck hog. I lied! He just, he just reached and grabbed me in his arms and walked right into Birmingham jail with me. I don't know any of y'all have ever been in jail, and I say, if you haven't been in jail, y'all to go one time because it's an experience that you'll, that you'll never get over, really. It's the most impressive thing that ever occurred to me. And I don't know why you've ever tried to look through that striped sun sign and tell yourself you're a big shot looking through the bars. It doesn't work. It doesn't ring through for some reason. They put me in a bullpen with about 50 people, and the time I hit the bullpen, and nobody's ever been in jail, you, if you've been in jail, you know what the next question is. The time you hit a bullpen and shut the door, somebody said, what you in for? <laughs> I said, child support. I said, Judge Smith will give you five years of hard labor for that. I like to die right then and there. I, I could see myself on the chain gang in Birmingham. A professional bondman came down and got me out. I walked off from a job that I had about 12 years of service in counting my military time and never went back to the office. I called my father and he came from Atlanta, Georgia and picked me up, took me back to Atlanta with he and my mother. I'm 35 years old and I go home to mom and daddy with all this education and everything. I go, now my mom always said the reason I drank liquor was because I lived with Ida. I said, anybody who lived with Ida would have to drink. <laughs> When I got home, it didn't take Mama about a week to realize what she had on her hand. <laughs> she told my father one morning, I never shall forget as long as I said, Clifford, I want you to load him up. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to load him up in that car and take him to South Georgia, down there to Ireland, and whatever it takes, I want you to get her to take him back because... She's the only one mean enough to live with him. <laughs> so you'd have to know my mama to understand this. My daddy did exactly what she said. He loaded me up, and the way we come to Statesboro, Georgia, and we get down there to see this woman that has caused me all this trouble. And I go down to see Ida and the children, try to talk to her, and we had many conferences. This is a story within itself. So anyway, we had all these conferences every day. And We'd be in there talking about her taking me back, and she would describe me, but she would add a lot of adjectives to it, you know. <laughs> she would, on the end of it, she'd say, and you're sorry as hell, you know. <laughs> and if you're from South Georgia, that's a special word. Now, y'all don't understand it, but now, you can call me anything, but I won't take that today. Don't call me sorry, because I'll fight you about it. 
That means you hang around the pool and bum cigarettes and, you know, and bum cocoa and, you know, this type of thing. It's a special word in South Georgia. So I was saying, you're sorry. I said, I'm not sorry. She said, yes, you are sorry. And she'd just tell me about what kind of individual I was. We'd get to talk to her every now and then. She'd run over and grab the phone and start dialing. She said, I'm going to have you locked up. I'm going to have you put on the chain gang here in Bullock County. I said, that's exactly where I want to be because I come out on that truck every day and wave at my children. You know? <laughs> this went on for days. I don't know how long these conferences went on, but finally she agreed to remarry. But she told me this. Now, y'all think about this. She said, I'm going to remarry you, but I ain't got a damn bit of use for you. You know? <laughs> Somebody's got to help look after these children, and you've been the only thing that's come by, you know. <laughs> so we remarried up there on Saturday morning, Baptist Church, right in the middle of town up there. And I don't know when y'all ever been to these second weddings or not. They're not a, they're not a festive occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody laughs. <laughs> Wasn't anybody throwing right, nothing, you know. <laughs> it, it was like a funeral. Nobody wanted to go. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. Nobody wanted to go. You know? <laughs> I wish that, I wish somebody could have made a you know a video of that deal. That's the thing. The side I've ever. You ever seen a woman come down an aisle of seven hundred seat church with her and three children coming down? <laughs> come up for the deal. Here's a preacher, and ain't nobody but me and I of the three youngers and a sister. I think that's all was there at the wedding, you know, and and. Uh, Preacher remarried us, and of course, I told her like every drunken year sold his wife, every man told his wife, I said, don't ever mention liquor to me again as long as you live. <laughs> I don't want to hear nothing about it. I'm through forever. But don't mention it. No more. So we remarried up in the Baptist Church, and we started down to Savannah, Georgia, 50 miles away, get, go on a little short honeymoon, try to get reacquainted. We got about 10 miles down the road, and of course, old brain started working again, you know, and I said, listen, since we're on our honeymoon, wouldn't it be all right if I had a drink of liquor today? <laughs> And, of course, I didn't know, devil, what was going on. She said, well, if you won't get drunk, it'll be all right. So I stopped and got a fifth of liquor, and I was dead dog drunk in two hours after I married. The honeymoon was a complete bust. We come back the next day both ashamed and embarrassed about the whole deal. I went to work with the highway department where I'm now employed, and I went to work cutting bushes and driving stakes. Laborer's job. And lucky to have it. By the way, lucky to have it. Tried to stay sober, stayed sober for a few weeks. We're not sure about how long this was now. And we closed out a job down there. We'd build a road, and the contractor gave a fish supper down there. And I went to the fish supper. Had plenty of liquor, and somebody asked me, could I take a drink? And I said, yeah, and I took one drink of liquor. And I came home that night, and I said, I'd have had a drink of liquor at the fish supper. She said, that's okay, you're not drunk. But let me tell you what happens now, folks. From this point on, till I come in Alcoholics Anonymous, every time I pick up a bottle, I wind up dead dog drunk. I lose all control of drinking liquor anymore. The next morning, after taking that drink that night, the next morning, rather than going to work, I go down to the county line 12 miles away. Our county's dry. And I go in there, that liquor store, and I get dead dog drunk right in the middle of the day for no reason whatsoever. Part cunning, baffling, and powerful. It's the most baffling thing that I know of in the world today. I get back on the stuff again, and this time I go straight to hell wide open with it. I shall never forget this, and y'all think about when we're building a job, and I'm down there supervising a the job, and I'm drinking on the job. I'm drinking every day of my life, and, and I thought, well, I, I'm too drunk. I don't want people to come by here and see me on the job drunk, so I'll get out here and lay, off, lay down off the side of the right of way, and we had cleared this area and was building a new four-lane road through there, and they had burned the woods off, and it was all burnt off, and I stepped off the side of the right of way, and I laid down, kind of got down to get sober, and I, but I laid down with a fifth with me, and I took the fifth down with me, and I, I lay down in every now and then, I take a little pull on that fifth. And I thought, well, the wreck, I'll get up and let everybody see me and let them, let them know I'm on the job because I was in charge of the job. But I laid down, and I kept nipping on that fifth, and wreck, I decided I ought to get up and let somebody see me, and I couldn't get up. And I crawled around on all fours out there like a hog all day long, rolling around in that black dirt where it had been burnt. And when I come out there, I just as black as ace of spades, and I tell you what's the truth. I, I look at it a lot of times. That ain't social drinking, is it? <laughs> I go by that spot. About twice a week now, and I look right over there, and when I pass that spot, every time I go down Frill 1 South, eight miles out of town, I look over and I say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I to myself again to have an awful lot of trouble, and I won't go into detail because this doesn't make good telling, really. I begin to write checks for liquor. I begin to charge liquor. I begin to do anything in the world once I start drinking. I don't know where to turn or what to do. At times, I went to church occasion. I wanted to, I wanted to quit drinking, but I had no answers. 
Nobody knew what to tell me. I'd, go, I'd take two or three drinks for liquor to go to church because I didn't want to go in the DTs while he's preaching, you know, and fly apart right in the middle of the sermon. And our church is not air-conditioned that time, and I'd get in that church with all that liquor in my body, you know, and everybody start sniffing and looking, you know, and finally they'd figure out who it was, you know, you sitting there, and I was embarrassed and ashamed about it, and I've been embarrassed and ashamed thousands of times as a result of drinking liquor. And ain't a man or woman in here who's an alcoholic doesn't understand what I'm talking about. I've been humiliated a thousand times because I was drinking. I was ashamed of what the hell was happening to me, and I didn't know where to turn or what to do about it. They're talking about the bathroom part I'd come to on the floor, you know, where I'd fallen, and I'd ask myself, what are you doing down here? I talked to myself a lot. Nobody else was talking to me, so I talked a lot to myself. What are you doing down here, CD? And I'd answer myself, this is where you fell. And I'd say, Lord, if I ever get up off of this floor, I won't ever do this again. I'll never do this again. And yet a week later, I'm laying in the same spot again, asking the same questions again. Cunning, baffling, and power. It got to the point, I don't know any of y'all ever stood this. I've been down to the liquor store and, and 12 miles down there at the county line, and the guy sleeps in the store down there because didn't somebody break in and steal it all. It's out in the woods. And you go down there, and I'd be sitting there at 7 o'clock in the morning. They can't open the late. I'd be sitting down in front of the liquor store. And you hear him in there flushing the commode, brushing his teeth. And finally, he opens the door, and you walk in and say, I just happened to be passing by. <laughs> Pull me a little water that way. I just happened to be passing by. I've been in there many times. Many times, walking in and say, give me a pint of that, and I'll write you a check. He says, CD, we got a drawer full of checks on you. I said, well, give all them to me, I'll write you one big one, you know. <laughs> this is insanity. I got involved in this. I got to the point I could no longer give checks. I could no longer charge liquor down there. No longer give me any credit. And I wound up over on the Geechee River, which is a river right near our hometown, about 15 miles away, drinking bootleg liquor. I don't want any of y'all ever drink any shine, white lightning, whatever. This was syrup liquor. It's a little different from white lightning, a little different from shine. Syrup liquor is a kind of, you use, you take corn buck and rather than putting sugar in it, you put cane syrup in it. Make it permit and then you distill it. Now anybody in our neck of the woods who buys eight or ten tons of sugar a month, they know he's making liquor. The revenues go catch him. So the people got smart and they begin to use cane syrup in the corn buck and then they distill it. And it comes out as syrup liquor, what is known as syrup liquor in our neck of the woods, isn't it? And the stuff is very powerful. The only thing about syrup liquor is when you drink a lot of it, your clothes stick to you. Stick on. And, and if you're out in the summertime drinking it, you can spot a guy half a mile away because he's, uh, he's doing like this. The, the, the yellow jackets and the bum, it's falling out. He's not. Now, they won't hurt you. They'll light in your mouth. You spit him out. He ain't going to sting you, but he, if you open your mouth, you pop right in there. I don't care what you do, because you want some of that sweet stuff, you know. <laughs> this is when a, I had to move me out of the house onto the back porch in a little closet by it. Because if you sleep on a mattress, you have to throw it away. You can't ever use a mattress again. It's, it's got an odor about it. That her sister would come over the house, she'd say, what's that I smell, you know? So I had to move me onto the back porch in a little closet, and I was working and making the living. and had a lady that was looking after the children, and I'm staying drunk. And I never had the benefit of a, a doctor or anybody to bathe my head. I have back here on a little cloth cot and a little closet with a little 40-watt bulb hanging right in my face, on a, hanging down with a little chain, I could pull it. And uh, I'd be back in that little cot with that thing to throw up in and a jug of water. And, and I'd have me a book, a Wild West book using, I'd have it on my chest. And three days later, I never would even turn the page. I'd open that big, just look at, look at that book. This is a horrible experience for a human being to go through this type of deal. And I don't know y'all know or not, if you've been drunk for a week or two, at least I was. I, coming off of a drunk in the shape I was in, I didn't have to breathe very much. And, and uh, this lady come out and peep in this little woman and look at me. And uh, she wouldn't see any movement. She'd think I was dead. She'd run and call out and say, Miss Collins, he's dead today, you know. <laughs> and I didn't even get it. She said, don't worry about it. I'll check on when I get home. <laughs> so I'd come home and they'd both get around and look in this window, you know. And, and if you've been drunk a week or two, you don't have to breathe very much. You know, you can take... You take a little breath and just wait a while. You know, you don't have to breathe. And I'd have to look at me sometimes, she said, for a long time, and, and there'd be no movement. She'd think I was dead, you know. And the rest, she'd see a slight movement. She'd say, that son of a bitch is not dead. <laughs> I apologize for that expression, but that's the only way you can tell that. Now, that's the way it was worded. And maybe he'll be dead tonight. Very hopeful she'd say this. Now, my father had already got her to take me back, and so there wasn't no getting rid of me, and I done knew this. She had been, and wasn't no, the only way she'd get rid of me is I'd die. And she prayed to God that I would die at this stage of the game, that I would die. 
This is the way it was in our home. This is living hell, ladies and gentlemen, if you've never been through this. I shall never forget the time that I left there. I knew Ida was bad about taking my liquor. And I woke up one morning, I couldn't find any liquor. And I knew there was liquor in the house, and I shall never forget this. I don't want I just reached up and kissed the drawers, because I used to put liquor in Ida's unmissables, you know, where she kept all the fine stuff. And I, I just take open those drawers and dump it and kick it. Dump it. I dumped everything in the house, pulled every match it off, every bed, put it all in the middle of the floor looking for liquor and I fell back on the bed grabbed the phone and fell back on the bed and looked right under the phone and that's at a full fifth of ancient age and let me tell you something had there been a hundred thousand dollars laying next to the ancient age and ancient age and somebody said you can have the hundred thousand dollars of the liquor but you can't buy liquor with the hundred thousand dollars now if you're an alcoholic you'll understand the next state which would you take the liquor I fell back on that bed and grabbed that fifth of whiskey started drinking right out of the box. This is the way things got in our home. It got to the point, and let me say this, every time I came up for air, and I think this happens to me, every time I came up and faced reality, then I couldn't stand it. I'd look at out of those children and realize the money that was gone, the jobs that were gone, everything had gone down the drain, and the only time I had any peace was when I was drunk. The only time that there was any peace when I got it all stopped right here. And so I was looking for oblivion all the time. I think one of the worst things that I ever did in my life, and, and I'm sure there were many more if I gave it all to you, was that uh, I came home for lunch one day and I took four one dollar bills out of her purse, all the money she had in the world, I went and bought liquor with. And this hurt me, ladies and gentlemen, this hurt me to do it to this lady right here. I was warning out, I didn't know how to get out, and yet while on a drunk I read in the Atlanta Journal about a place in Atlanta, Georgia, that it took drunks that you could go there. And I called out in the room and asked her would she call my mother and then get her to come get me because I wanted to go to this place. And I didn't know what they would do to you and didn't make any difference. And I went out my mother and sister came to Statesboro, Georgia and loaded me up in a car and carried me to Atlanta, Georgia, 220 miles away and put me in the Georgia Alcoholic Clinic. And there for the first time I heard the word al alcoholism. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. You can learn to live without drinking, but it will be hard. It will be the hardest thing you've ever done. And I thank God. Today we ought to be real careful in Alcoholics Anonymous when somebody walks in the door and says, well, hey, you're going to sober up and everything's beautiful. Because that ain't the way it was with C.D. Collins. They said it would be the hardest thing I had ever done in my life. There they recommended Alcoholics Anonymous. They followed the Alcoholics Anonymous program in this hospital. And I was hospitalized for six weeks there. I took the fourth and fifth step there with a man by the name of Dean DeOves, a minister. And I shall never forget this. It took all one afternoon. And ladies and gentlemen, let me say now, I broke all the commandments, all of them. I went out and told this gray-haired man, great big white shock of hair, and went in his office and told him everything in the world that ever happened to C.D. Collins. I had written it down and read it off to him. And I thought if anybody listened to this garbage, they would have had a fit. I thought he would have fell out of chair and gone into a convulsion. But he sat there with compassion in his eyes, and when I got through, he said, C.D., God will forgive you if you'll ask him earnestly and sincerely. God will forgive you for what you've done. But you've got to forgive yourself. And this opened the door for me. It might not make sense to any of you, but it did to me. You've got to forgive yourself. He got on his knees on one side of that desk and prayed, and I got on my knees on this side and I prayed. And let me say here now, if I don't say anything else that makes any sense, God will forgive you if you'll ask him earnestly and sincerely. God will forgive you. This I personally guarantee because... When I got up off my knees, I felt a relief like I had never known in my entire life. A weight had been lifted from me. Not that whether or not I'd ever drink again. I didn't, that didn't even occur to me. But a weight had been lifted. While I was in this Georgia Alcoholic Clinic, I had notified the highway department. They fired me while I was there, and I called out. And she, I called and asked about coming home. And she said, don't come back down here because I'm going to divorce you. I don't ever want to see you again. But when I was released from there, I went back down to Statesboro, Georgia, and stayed in the basement of a hotel. And I went around to see Ida and the children, and she would let me come around to see them during the day. And I asked God, I said, before you sign the final papers, would you let's pray about this and ask God's guidance in this thing? And she says, no, I'm not going to do that. You're a con artist. I'm not going to. I'll listen to you some minute. I'm not going to have anything else to do with you. I kept insisting that she pray with me. Let me say here now. Had you known the facts, if I gave you the facts of what existed between me and this woman, what I had done to this woman, and said, what would you advise these two people to do? You would have said, walk away from each other, never look back, because you don't stand a chance. Finally, I agreed to pray with me. We went back in the back bedroom in her house where she was living, got on our knees. 
I prayed. She didn't pray. I asked God to tell us whether or not we should try to live together and make a home for these children. And we got up off our knees and came out of the bedroom. And as we walked back through the dining room, go in the living room, I said, you can go get your clothes and move back in here. We'll try again. And I went and got my clothes and moved back in with her and the children. Caught a ride back to the work. Again, had no automobile, no money whatsoever. And let me say now a big compliment to the Alanons. Alanon, lady in Statesboro, Georgia, a woman, non-alcoholic, got AA started in Statesboro, Georgia. She read in the paper about AA. Got it started in Statesboro, Georgia, and they called us and asked us to come to the meeting, and we did. We attended the meeting of four people. When I, me and three other people went to the first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in Statesboro, Georgia. And I've been there ever since. This is the greatest thing that ever happened to AA. I'm glad I'm an alcoholic. And I hear a lot of people say, well, I, I, I can't say that. I've been in three years, two years. I'm glad I'm an alcoholic. Because were I not an alcoholic, I could have gone through life drinking liquor, raising hell, hurting everybody I touched, and not giving a damn well, I, about a living soul except me. I could have gone through life like this. But it has changed my life, and it's changed it terrifically. In the time we've been here, and it still is. It's a beautiful journey. It's an experience to get sober, to find out who you are and who you, what you're trying to do and what it's all about. God, it's the most fascinating thing I've ever gotten involved in my life is finding out something about C.D. Collins and trying to help my fellow man. And that's how simple it is today. That's what I do. Nothing else other than that. My sobriety comes first. Above everything. Out of the children, job, everything else. You know, a lot of people don't understand this much I thought. But this is true. Now, let me say for the benefit of the new person, when you get sober a lot of times and begin to try to face reality, it's one hell of a shock to the system, you know to try to assume to pay the bills and assume responsibility again. And I, to myself, had a lot of trouble after sobering up, after coming into AA. We had a lot of problems, communication problems, you know, learning how to talk to one another. I didn't know who she was. She didn't know who I was. I'd been drunk. She said she'd been married to three, three men in her lifetime. You know, the one she married at first, the drunk, and now the guy who's sober in AA. Three different people in her lifetime. So we had a lot of growing pains we went through. And some of them I'll share with you. I shall never forget this one. I eat an egg over very light. I want to hit it with a fork and it run all over the plate like stirred up grits. And that's why I eat an egg. <laughs> if it don't run, I don't eat it. You know, it's just that simple. So I came down one morning for breakfast, she and the girls, and I hit the egg and the egg didn't run. I've been so about a year, I guess, maybe two years. I said, I, I don't eat no damn done egg. She said, let me tell you something. Just because you are sober and you want me and these girls to push the foot around you and Bow and scrape, you just, now if you want to get drunk, you go get drunk. I said, damn, if you're going to get me drunk, so for the next seven years, I eat breakfast uptown. <laughs> so I tell that for one purpose, when you run into a brick wall, back up and go around the damn thing, you know. And let me say this now then, I still eat breakfast uptown. I don't eat with her. She's a beautiful lady at night, but not in the morning. <laughs> Well, say lay something else on y'all. I get criticized by it. I get up every morning, I plug that coffee and make her a cup of coffee, and I take it to the bed and ease. I said, honey, here's your coffee. She said, mm. You know, and I walk right out the door and go uptown, and I'm gone. I don't stay around for no conversation because she don't want to talk in the morning talk, and I'm a talker. So this I do, but I've had a lot of people criticize me about taking her that coffee every morning. But it pays off. That night it pays off. <laughs> So you guys that don't do that, try it. It brings all kind of good things, I'll tell you that. It sure does. Been in AA about five years, sober going day and night. I was working as a very good job and making one girl in college, one in high school, another boy in about seventh grade. Y'all listen to this one. I'd come on one day and said, I've been to Buster. That's our doctor. We call him Buster. I said, I've been to Buster. I said, he said, not to worry about anything. He said, all women my age are having this problem. I said, okay, so we wait a while, she goes back to Buster, and then she come back that day and informed me that she's pregnant. <laughs> now, y'all think about this. She's making twice as much money as I'm making. We've got a girl in college, another fixing to go to college, and Ida comes up pregnant. This will test whether or not you've got the AA program. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know what in the world we were going to do. We liked it, went crazy. And our daughter, who was a senior in high school, come in, and she got terribly upset. She said, Mama, what am I going to tell my friends, you know? 
I mean, she thought mom and daddy would all be doing that kind of monkey bit about <laughs> We had a son born. He's now 17 years old, graduating from high school this year. And ladies and gentlemen, let me see here now. The good Lord knows what's best for you. I don't know. I don't know. I turn my will over to the care of God. I prayed about the talk tonight. And let him run the show. And he knows, hell, he knows better to run it than C.D. Collins. And I know how to run it. We had this son born. And when he was born, there were about 18 people standing right outside the door when he was born. And they were Alan Arns and they, and they brought him right out the door. He still went and undone. I said, yeah, yeah, you got another son. Huh? God, that was great. I got to change his diapers and feed him. I rocked him till he was 13 years old. His feet were dragged around. <laughs> I picked him up like that and walked the building. Hell, I'd rock you now if he let me, but he won't, he won't, you know. <laughs> One of the greatest experiences I've ever had because I didn't have it with others. And I thank God for this experience because this is a boy that, that his daddy shared with him. And I, I'm, I'm running into a little difficult now. He, he don't like my daddy to put his hands on him anymore. And it's just because I love him so much, I want to just pat him, you know. And he'll, you know, doesn't like it. Play, football player and all that stuff, you know. But we, two or three years ago, we're coming through the woods and been squirrel hunting Riding through that old Jeep I got, and we ride along, he said, Daddy, ain't nobody got a daddy like I got. And let me tell you right now and then, now if you don't think that is worthwhile and so bright, and the tears ran off of my cheeks, and then I drove another mile before I could answer this kid, because he, he was telling me something that, that nothing but the grace of God would I had him and had this experience of being with this boy, and hunting with him, and fishing with him, and flying airplanes, and flying helicopters and, with this young one. And we've had a beautiful relationship. Now, the son that was born while I was in Korea, C.D. the third. And the reason I tell this is only for one purpose, because it's a very touchy situation with me and Ida. It's because there's always somebody in the audience who come up and say, C.D., I appreciate what you said. This boy that was born while I was in Korea, C.D. the third. He discovered alcohol and women at the same time, and he blew, ladies and gentlemen. And when he blew, he blew with a big deal. And he got into a lot of trouble, this boy did. And I love this boy very dearly. And yet the time came in his life when we could no longer handle the situation. And Daddy and Mama had done everything in the world they could for this son. And on a Sunday morning, the local sheriff called me and said, C.D., I want you to bring Doug up here. I'm going to put him in jail. <coughs> and had, um, had my son told me, said, Daddy, I don't want to go. I don't deserve to go. He wouldn't have gone because I'm the type of individual I would die for my young in a minute. And I would have... I put him on a plane and left the country with him, whatever come necessary for this, this boy. But I loaded my son up in my automobile on a Sunday night and drove him up there to the county jail. And, and then they opened the door and I took my boy in and let him close the cold steel on my young'un. Nothing but the grace of God in that year program you can survive on a deal like this because when what happened to this boy, when I found out about it, I shall never forget it as long as I live. I was in his bedroom when I found out about it. And in my, coming out of his bedroom across the hall into my room between the mattresses laid a 38 special. And I kept it in. When I found out what happened to my son, the first thought occurred to me, I can't, I can't handle this, I'm going to blow my brains out. And I walked across the hall into the bedroom to get the pistol to stick in my mouth. And as I come across the hall, the thought occurred to me, C.D., why don't you do what you tell other people to do? And I walked right in there where the gun was laying, fell on my knees, and my head wasn't six inches from the gun, and I said, God, I can't handle this. That was my prayer, God, I can't handle this. And ladies and gentlemen, every time... I have ever prayed in desperation, God answered prayer for me. So when I got up off my knees, I knew things were going to work out. Things would work out. The boy had to go to jail. And in our local jail, in our local town, he had to go to jail. And we had to live with this thing. He'd like to kill us. This boy who had not been to Sunday school or church in for years, who did not speak to his father at all, my reason, my relationship, over a year ago, he came to our house back in Tifton, Georgia. He had finished college in the meantime, and he'd come home over a year ago, and we'd start uptown to get breakfast. And the reason I'm going to cut out a lot of this, and we, we pulled out of our yard to start uptown to get breakfast, he said, Daddy, said, I've been searching all my life for some answers, and said, I finally found an answer. I said, what's that, son? He said, I found God. And there again, the tears fell off my cheek into my lap. He said, I found God. And if I was home... This Sunday with him, he'd be sitting in church with me. He goes to Sunday school, and he meets me behind, holds him in church, and we sit together. This boy's a big hunk of beautiful man. He's got it all together. So God answers prayer. So if you people who are here, if anybody's got the same type of trouble, for goodness sakes, pray about it. Every time I've ever prayed in desperation, I got an answer. God answers prayers. This boy doesn't drink liquor. He's sober now. He finished college, has a good job, and 
He sits in church with his daddy every Sunday. So what better can you have than that? And I told this item for a purpose. I'm sure it bothers you, but I had to tell it because there's always somebody here that needs to hear this type of thing. The AA program is a way of life out of myself. It's a way we live. I, I attend three meetings a week in my own group. It's a regular thing, and if I get bent out of shape, I go to five, six, or seven. We have 16,000 people in my hometown, 6,000 student college there, total about 22,000 people. We'll have 125 people at a meeting, at a closed AA meeting, we'll have these many people. We're not anonymous in Statesboro, Georgia. We're very enthusiastic. It's more of an asset to belong to AA and is a country club in Statesboro, you know. <laughs> you, can write, you can ride around the square and every, every name you read on the square, we got some of them right down in the club, you know. Had a lot of people who wanted to join, said, City would like to join. I said, you got to drink some liquor, though. We can't, can't get them down without doing that. Have a beautiful club. Have a lot of young people in our club. We have we, we had one boy who was 15. He's been so what, two years now, now. He's 17, 18 now. And had, got, oh, 8 or 10, 15 college students in the 20s in our group. Have a beautiful time. We had a lot of enthusiasm about what we're doing. If you're not enthusiastic in your own group, hell, you, you something missing there, you know, something missing. Be enthusiastic about you so by time about mine. I enjoy being sober. I enjoy the freedom it gives me, the freedom of movement, the fact that I can look everybody and I say, hey, I'm as good as you are. I'm not any better, but I'm as good. I can walk down the street unashamed, unafraid anymore, you know. Hey, he hadn't cured everything. Me didn't cure, it didn't cure the check writing deal. I still have a problem with that. <laughs> the bills come due and I said, I ought to pay them. She said, you ain't got no money in the bank. I said, that ain't got a damn thing to it. Write them a check. But the difference is now the bank, because it's a CD you've overdrawn, you better come up here. And I said, go up and make some arrangements. So thank God for this. In this program of Alcoholics Anonymous, we've had the privilege of traveling the length and breadth of this country, meeting a lot of people and meeting people who share their love with us. And let me say here and now, if you haven't found love, L-O-V-E, love, and doesn't have a damn thing to do with S-E-X, just L-O-V-E, love, the love of one human being for another, if you haven't found it, then you've missed the boat. For goodness sakes, avail yourself of what's here. I have never said in an AA meeting in my life, if you get still, you've got to push everything out of your mind. If you do it right here in this auditorium, you can do the same thing. And feel, feel the power. The power's here. There ain't no doubt in my mind about it. I can go sit down in the club for an hour and feel the power, knowing when I leave there that I'll stay sober another 24 hours. That's guaranteed. I heard a man my first year in AA says, by the name of Tom P. Some of you have heard him. Max has heard him, I'm sure, many times. Tom P. in Chappaqua, New York. He said the AA program is guaranteed to work. It will work under all conditions. Were this not true, I would not have a damn thing to do with this statement he made. He said you can lose your health, your wealth, your wife. Everything can go down the drain on you. If you practice the program to the best of your ability, you won't drink, you won't lie, you won't cheat, you won't run, you won't steal. And I bought what the man said and he told me the truth because it's worked for me. Since coming in there, I myself have had all the problems that any two people could have. Money trouble, job trouble, child trouble, death in the family. You name it. We've had it all. And yet it's never occurred to me to take a drink of liquor. Never entertained the idea. I entertained the idea instead of killing myself. But never did it occur to me to take the drink of liquor because the program works. We found a way to live out of myself. you our wildest dreams. I don't have anything to leave to the children in a monetary way. I'm accumulated a lot. And I think the good Lord smiled on me in this. At least this may be my cop out. I don't know. Because I think if I had a lot of money, I'm, I'm naturally, I'm a frustrated big shot. And I, I think it'd run me just as crazy as hell if I had a lot of money. <laughs> you know? So God looked after me. You know, I asked for his guidance, and this is the way he's handled it. I've seen it happen to some of my friends, and y'all and y'all have too. And, it's, and, and man, they've had one hell of a time with it. Some of my buddies have. It, it accumulated a lot. I have a decent job, a decent home, no money. Educated three children, finished college. Fourth, this little boy that's coming up now, we can send him to school, it looks like. Let him finish and maybe he can get a good job. But this is what it is given me and I, a way to live. So we don't have anything to leave to the children, but I would like to bequeath the A way of life to them as a legacy, you know, to my children. As a way to live. Because I have never found love and understanding anywhere in the world. I don't find it in my church, like I do here. Because I can come up here and blow this talk, I can come up here and say whatever I want. And you people say, hey, C.D., you did all right. Like somebody told me, I said, why worry about it? Why get in dry mouth? C.D., they'll accept you. You get up and tell your story, they're going to accept you, and they'll love you in spite of, they'll love you warts and all, you know what I mean? They'll, they'll do this. And this is what it's all about. I don't have any closing remarks to leave to other than this is a way of life which 
I to myself have grown to love, and I'm going to retire from the highway department this year, and we're going to travel the countryside, visiting groups, and I'm coming back out here. I'm still flying airplanes. I retired from the military last November flying there. I got the flying helicopters. And now, boy, that's a hell of a note coming jet down the helicopter, but I did. And that's the most frustrating thing I've got to hold my life, a damn helicopter. You've never tried to fly one of them. That'll get you drunk itself. You ain't killed. <laughs> but I learned to fly those, and I flew out of Longview last weekend and going back to all those storms to Georgia. And I still do a lot of praying, and I, and I believe in the power of prayer. I'll fall down and pray any time. Things get rough for me. And as we left Longview and all that, you know, we got over Longview, it was hot, Max, you remember that? And then I left this sunny, it was sleep, snowing. Five minutes in there, the there, there, windshield iced up. Ten minutes in there, I looked out and the wings had iced up on this airplane. And we go from Longview to Savannah, Georgia. We climbed that baby up to 19,000 feet, and it was 20 degrees below zero up there. Old C.D. did a lot of praying. We went through an airliner. It wasn't even landing in Atlanta. We went on to Savannah, Georgia, and landed. So the good Lord smiles on C.D. Collins. This I know. If you haven't experienced anything like I've said up here tonight, for goodness sakes, avail yourself of what's in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I guarantee if you're an alcoholic, then the answer is here if you'll get in the fellowship. I don't mean around the periphery, I mean in it. And the way I become a part of Alcoholics Anonymous is mopping floors, picking up ashtrays. This made me a part of my group. I love my group very dearly. That's where my sobriety is. Not up here talking to you. My sobriety is back in my own group. I'm not interested in listening to anything you tell me about Alcoholics Anonymous that you don't go. You can't tell me a damn thing. You go to Alcoholics Anonymous and you practice this program and I listen to you all day. If you don't, I'm not interested, really, because this is the only way I function right here is going to A, not talking. But I want to say again to you people that I myself, we are very grateful to be here. It's a privilege and a pl pleasure to be here. And I want to experience the love and fellowship that you have. Thank you very much.